We're going to check back in on the Dr. Husel trial later. But first, we want to start with an exclusive interview following a verdict that many did not see coming. A Florida jury has acquitted Curtis Reeves of shooting Chad Olson inside a movie theater on Friday. The six-member jury found him not guilty of all charges. That includes second-degree murder and aggravated battery for the 2014 killing as well as an injury to the wife, Nicole Olson. Reeves claimed self-defense, telling the jurors that he felt that his life was in jeopardy after an argument over a cell phone. It was a dramatic night right here on Court TV. Let's take a look at how it played out. Verdict. We the jury finds as follows. The defendant is not guilty. So say we all this 25th day of February, 2022, juror number two, four person. In the courts of the Sixth Judicial Circuit in and for Pasco County, Florida, State of Florida versus Curtis Jetson Reeves, case number 2014, CF 216, CF AXES, information four, count two, aggravated battery, verdict. We the jury find as follows. The defendant is not guilty. So say we all this 25th day of February, 2022, juror number two, four person. Joining us now is the attorney for Chad Olson's widow, Nicole, TJ Grimaldi. TJ, thank you again for joining me. I know that you've spoken with me before and others of us here at Court TV. I want to preface this like I did last time with recognizing that although Curtis Reeves is a free man, he's been found innocent of this charge. It doesn't take away from the fact that Chad Olson was killed and is deceased. And so first, certainly recognizing um, thoughts to Nicole and her family as she goes through uh, a horrific loss, quite frankly. Now, having said that, TJ, tell us if you would, what was Nicole's first reaction when she heard this verdict? First of all, thank you for the kind words and thank you for having me. Um, Unfortunately, as you saw from the clip, I was not even able to make it back to court in time uh, because the jury reached a verdict so fast. However, I did speak with her as she was leaving the courtroom and she was in total shock, total disbelief, disgust, sadness. I, I, there's not enough words to describe how difficult this was for her. How did you feel? I mean, as an attorney, as a lawyer who tries cases, who's familiar with the criminal law system, what was your initial reaction when you heard the verdict? So, of course, as we all know, in the, in, when we're lawyers and, and in the judicial system, whenever anything goes to a jury, you never really know what's going to happen. It could be a toss-up either way. But I really thought that the optics of this case would prevent a jury from finding him not guilty of all charges. I thought maybe they would find him guilty of a lesser included but I, I am, to be honest, floored that they reached this conclusion. And worse, I really am nervous for the future about what this means for stand your ground law and what different criminal defense attorneys will use from this case to get other defendants off. And I, I think it's fair to say that in response to that, certainly this outcome means that defendants and attorneys representing defendants are going to be prepared to pursue this, the self-defense claim, because to your point, you never know what a jury's going to do. And a jury of six said he's not guilty, even of the lesser included, including the things like manslaughter. So he walked out of jail, excused, dismissed by the court, and off he went back to his life as an innocent man from that jury verdict. What about one of the things that we know noticed in court TV was there, Nicole was visibly upset before the verdict was even read. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that, TJ, and, and how she felt going into it to have that much emotion and tears prior to the verdict. Well, first of all, let me, let me address your comment from before. Uh, I, I have strong concern that the legislature did not intend to for this law to be used in this way. And so I have a lot of concern moving forward that criminal defense attorneys will use this case to get a, to get their client off of pretty much anything. I mean, who knows, maybe the next time we hear about this, it'll be a pillow fight and the pillow fight will end in a death and they will claim that they were in fear for their life and, and be able to get off the charges. But to uh, address your question specifically, 
I think it was just eight years worth of emotion and eight years worth of reliving the situation and eight years worth of suffering. And she knew walking into that courtroom that regardless of what the outcome was, this was going to be her closure. And I think as a result, her emotions just took control over her and she wasn't able to remain that strong and uh, steady composure that you'd seen for the past eight years. Right. And I want to go, I appreciate you answering the question about your concern about the intent of the legislation, because we know when laws become laws, they've been drafted, and the intent of the legislation sometimes isn't what, what then happens with the practice of that law. Do you think, TJ, that we can expect anyone to, especially prosecutors, really, they have a strong association to say, we want this changed, rewritten, so that it's very clear the intent, and this can't be something that can be utilized in the wrong way by defense attorneys. I hope so, and I hope you're right. I can tell you, I know that after the verdict, you guys had uh, Bryant Camarino on, and while him and I have known each other for a long time, and I respect him as a lawyer tremendously, I disagree with him completely. I believe that this sets a terrible, terrible precedent moving forward, and I also practice criminal defense law, and I will tell you that without a doubt, from this point forward, if I represent an individual that is being charged with a violent crime, there is absolutely no question that I will raise stand your ground every single time because it would it would hurt my client's position not to. But this was a little different legally, stand your ground versus self-defense, because we know that the stand your ground was denied by the court before it went to trial. So then at trial, it became the self-defense that the prosecution then has that burden to say it wasn't done in self-defense. Clearly, the jury found that it was. But doesn't it, though, also, TJ, go to the mental of that particular defendant? What do I mean by that? This defendant got up there and said he was afraid. Regardless of what outsiders and viewers think watching that trial, that's what he said. I think if you have a defendant who says that, that they believed that their life was in danger, they were in fear, then it can be argued self-defense is going to be successful. I completely agree with you. I, that, that's the difficulty with this law. Um, I think Mr. Escobar kept saying the beauty of this law, the beauty of this law, but that's also the difficulty of this law at the same time. Because somehow, some way, we have to figure out as lawyers how to from the defense side, make people understand the fear, and from a prosecution side, uh, make people understand that there's no way that the defendant could have been in fear. And, and I think that as a result of the way that the jury instructions are written for self-defense and for senior ground, both for that matter, it, it just makes a very difficult situation because I guess as long as the individual just says, hey, I'm in fear, I guess that's enough to convince someone that they're in fear. Even though, you know, Mr. Reeves is not a tiny man, I understand that he may have been a senior citizen at the time, but he was 6'2", 270 pounds, former karate champion, as he indicated on multiple occasions, former SWAT team member and uh, in charge of SWAT. If anyone could have defended themselves and even forget that, if anyone could have de-escalated a situation and or understood how to remove themselves from that situation, that's this man. But instead, somehow, some way, he was able to say that he was in the most fear he has ever been in his entire life, which I find laughable that he even suggests something like that after being in the law enforcement for 20 years and being the head of the SWAT team, which usually goes after the worst crimes um, for all those years. Let me ask you this, given you were there for so much of the trial in person, I know you may not have been able to make it back for the verdict, but during the course of this trial, I always saw you there um, seated next to a couple of spots over from Nicole. If you watched on TV, it looked like when the defendant Curtis Reeves, now a free man, when you saw him come off the stand and talk with the prosecutor and point out, and when they had him come off the stand, how did he appear to you in terms of his size? Did he look to this jury like as big of a man as he did at some times on the screen? I, I think there's no question. I, I don't see how a jury couldn't have uh, seen that he's a big man especially ironically that the prosecutor happened to be of shorter statute. So it just made him look that much bigger. But as you can see right now on the screen, he is a huge man. He is, you know, he's almost 80 years old at this point. He's 270, if not more uh, pounds and at least six foot two. This guy is not a frail being. He definitely has the look of someone that would be able to 
to help their own situation. And I think that the state proved that by suggesting all the activities that he was doing immediately prior to this, this incident. I know there was some hunting that he alluded to and, and deer hunting and things like that that just some of our, our guest analysts pointed out that they thought it was a good thing the prosecution did point out all of those things. Do you know, and you may not know the answer to this, you and I have not at all discussed this, but I'm curious, do you know if there was ever a plea deal offered in this criminal case? Uh, I can tell you that there wasn't one. Uh, the way that the Pinellas Pasco State Attorney's Office works is they don't negotiate plea deals. Uh, if the defendant uh, in any of the cases in Pinellas and Pasco come to the state attorney's office with a plea deal, the Pinellas Pasco state attorney's office will at least accept or deny that uh, offer, but they don't make offers across the board. That's pretty much what they're known for. And my understanding is that while there was a brief discussion about a plea, because the defendant did not come to the table with any offer, uh, it kind of died on the vine. All right, thank you. TJ, you're gonna stay with us. Nicole Olson, in that movie theater, saw her husband get shot. He died as a result of that wound. Eight years later, that's right, on Friday, the jury said this defendant is not guilty. He admitted that he did shoot Chad Olson, but found not guilty. TJ Grimaldi, who represents Nicole, the wife, is gonna stay with us. We'll have more of Nicole's reaction to this verdict when we come back.